Inside this room, all of my dreams become realities, and some of my realities become dreams. What in the wide, wide world of sports is going on here? Alive, alive, it's alive, it's alive! You are listening to The Wilder Ride, getting wilder by the minute. Here are your hosts, Alan Sanders and Walt Murray. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Wilder Ride Listener's Lounge, a sidecast to our main podcast, where instead of looking at a movie one minute at a time, we bring on a special guest and kind of look at their life one moment at a time. I'm your host. I'm Alan Sanders. I am your co-host, Walt Murray. And Walt, we are getting ready for some major feasting later this week. We're recording this prior to Thanksgiving. I am uh, getting my stretch pants ready and... um... I, uh, I'm going to kill some Turkey next week. Oh, I Not told my literally, wife, but literally I told my wife, I'm like, never get rid of those maternity pants. I need one pair, just the one with the little expandable <laughs> pouch in the front that just, it's sort of like the fish bowl, you know, the goldfish principle that says the, the goldfish grows to the size of the bowl. I just make sure I've got lots of stretch and my stomach will grow to fit that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it's good that we're both uh, on the same page here and ready to roll. You know, I don't normally endorse gluttony, but when it comes to Thanksgiving, I think there's a one day pass. Well, we have a lot to be thankful for, and I just feel like the best way to express that is by killing myself with calories. (laughs) Is putting myself in a near comatose state with too much food, too much drink, and way too much football. (laughs) What could be better? Oh, and let's throw family dynamics into that one. (laughs) Oh, uh, yeah. Do we really want to do that? No, no. <laughs> I'm going to actually have it easy. My wife is in uh, New York. She decided to go up to go to her dad's up in upstate New York. And then the two of them will drive to her brother's house, the oldest of the uh, of the progeny, and have Thanksgiving there in Maryland. And they'll spend a couple of days in Maryland. And then she'll be back home. I think think she spoke i thought she was coming back sunday but i think she told me no 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 i need sunday as a day of recovery from all the driving so that way i can be back to work on monday so i'll be coming back saturday so she drove up check this out walt 16 hours one way on a tuesday morning like she oh got up at gosh. two o'clock in the morning and left at 2 30 a.m then two days later drives to maryland eight hours should only take five but because of all the holiday travel got caught with traffic and then when she does come back home she's going to take another eight hours to get here and she's doing that all within the space of a week Ugh. well and the bad thing too is she's got to go from one end of atlanta to the other so uh you never know how that's going to turn out traffic wise yeah so thankfully she uh she loves driving she doesn't mind the powering through i have long since realized if it's more than a five-hour drive i think it's more important to fly and get to your destination and start having fun but she would rather drive and have her car. And I get that. So more power to her. I get the house to myself. Yeah, I, that'll be uh, kind of nice. And at the same time, probably a little too quiet. Well, you know what? Here's the thing. I do have a huge project that's been in front of me. And part of it's going to be a surprise. She doesn't know this, but uh, her best friend, Cindy, and I have been conspiring as sort of a pseudo Christmas present. Uh, Cindy is doing... All of the interior design work, she's already picking up colors and pieces and furniture. And my job is to assemble, build, and do the grunt work. I'll be doing the walls. I'll be doing the floor. I'll be doing um, all the demo, get all the rugs and stuff out of there. This is basically Sophie's old bedroom. And what we've decided is we don't want her back. So her bedroom is now a sitting room. Perfect. Or will be. That's perfect. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, she's like, wait, where's my room? It's not your room. You're done. You're out. You're you're on your son. In this case, daughter, you're on your own. Well, I heard you say something on the radio today. You and uh, Mike Garcia were talking about that, that it was basically you graduated. You're gone. Right. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Fly bird. Look, I'm not trying to be cold. I think that's successful parenting. If they don't have to come back. Absolutely. They can survive. They've got jobs and a place to live and, and they've got their bills paid and they, and they continue to do the things they need to do to keep paying their bills. And I'm good. Yeah. That's i I'll see you at holidays. Smart thing. (laughs) 
That's the smart thing. And I think that you learn that a lot of life is prevent defense and you just don't let anybody get the big plays by you. And right. you, you know, you keep on doing what you got to do day in, day out for a long, long time. And, and that breeds success. It does. And sometimes you got to power and you know, you can't, you know, it's a good, let's, let's segue because this is the week we should be talking about things we're thankful for. I think too often we worry about the food. We don't remember that why we're getting together to have that food in the first place. The food is secondary. It really is about a day of giving thanks. Yeah, you know? it is. And so I kind of already put some stuff out on Twitter, but I, I figure why not talk about it here? And that way people can relive it again. I had like four or five things I just wanted, and I'll do it very, very quickly. And then I, I'll invite you to do the same if you want. But my first one is obviously for family. Huge thank you for family, including my four-legged fur buddies, because our dogs are every bit a part of the family. And in fact, bring me more joy than most people I know. I'm thankful for living in the greatest country on the earth. It has its flaws, but no country is perfect. There's no such thing as a perfect country, but nobody is breaking the door down to leave this country. Rather, they're breaking the doors down to try to get here. So yes, there's got to be absolutely. something going on here. I'm, I'm thankful we still have the First Amendment, although that keeps getting tighter and tighter. But we're yeah. still so far on paper anyway, allowed to say things that we think or believe. And even if we're wrong, we're supposed to be able to have that freedom to be wrong, to have the discourse. I worry that we're starting to see more and more of the clamping down of, uh, of approved narratives and approved facts until the powers that be decide, oh, okay, now we can change you know, the, the course because new facts have come to light. But prior to that, we're going to cancel everybody's Facebook and Twitter. But um, right now, I still think we got a First Amendment, right? <laughs> For now. I mean, on paper. Um, I am thankful for the job that I have somehow lucked into a uh, combination of work and luck with being in radio. It's the, one of the few jobs I've ever had in my life where I actually feel bad when I take time off. I feel like I'm missing out on what I'd, I want to be doing. And I wish that for everybody to have a job you love so much that you almost have, not to say that you don't take time off because you need it, but you almost have that pang of, I could really be at work and still be just as happy. Yeah, that, that's a nice, nice feeling. Last but not least, because of what I do, I'm very thankful. And I think you would dovetail on this with this podcast. Thankful for all the listeners, all the supporters, all the friends and, and, and people we've met along the way of our radio and podcast journeys. Yeah, no doubt. And, and really, for me, kind of the same uh, right along that same line. Just so thankful for my family. Uh, the last couple of years have been uh, rough in many ways, and my family has been super supportive, and um, that has uh, has been a a, a real um, something to be thankful for. It, it has, I mean, it has been a crazy couple of years, and uh, so I'm really thankful for that. And of course, my kids are just amazing, and um, you know they have uh, gone through a lot the last uh, couple of years as well, losing their grandmother and. Uh, than all the other craziness in our lives. And uh, then also just thankful that uh, we really are in a country where we can travel freely and do a lot of things that we want to do and, and get together with family to celebrate and um, not have the government intrude too much on us. You know? Yeah. Yeah. That one's eroding a little, but we hopefully will yeah. get it back. <laughs> yeah. I'm not real thankful for gas prices as I look to travel this year. No, but uh you know, and then uh, I have a, a significant, significant other in my life, and that's been a real surprise and blessing. I certainly wasn't planning on that. That kind of came out of the blue. It certainly takes the edge off all the other crap. It does. It does. <laughs> and having somebody that I can kind of go, wow, my life is kind of nuts and be able to talk through some things and and uh, have that person there. It's pretty amazing. And then, uh, uh, you know, really thankful for my job as well. Um you know, my real job can be a little bit crazy at times, but uh, it is definitely a blessing to get up every morning and go do something that I enjoy. Um, even though it does come with some uh, sharp edges, sometimes it's still uh, great and amazing. And uh, I wouldn't trade the job for anything other than the winning lottery ticket, uh, but I would probably still end up coming in. Uh, we'd probably have a few more employees around, but uh 
uh, so that I wouldn't have to do as much, but <laughs> I'd still show up every day. Yeah. That's how, and, you know, you found the job you love that you could win the lottery and go, okay, now the pressure of having to work for the paycheck is gone, but I still love what I do. And I'm still going to come. Yes. In. No doubt about it. No doubt about it. And I got to say, don't mm-hmm. forget moose. Yeah. Moose and rascal. Yeah. <laughs> I just love that them. dog's and, name moose. <laughs> oh, and it fits him perfectly. He is a gigantic. In fact, I'll, uh, I'll post some pictures of him after this uh, comes out. Uh, get a post a picture of, of Moose and Rascal so people know what we're talking about. And, <laughs> and of course, Moose, before we got him, uh, he was a stray and uh, got him from the Humane Society. And he had to have some teeth pulled. So his tongue will kind of hang out at times and we call him Mooth. Mooth. Because <laughs> he's got no teeth. Don't <laughs> Mooth. So... Uh, <laughs> but definitely thankful for that's Moose and, great Booth and Rathcall. And it's funny when you throw him a treat and he doesn't catch it, he's got to kind of scrape it up off the floor. It's uh it's pretty pretty entertaining. So uh so you gotta love Mooth. Uh he love is it. uh he's he's quite quite the guy. Um yeah, and then just uh you know, all the all the listeners are uh, really just fantastic. I mentioned this last year that um you know, when I went through all that with my mom and uh, just how people were great and sending me notes and, you know, touching base with me and just seeing how I was doing and, um, you know, and just all the entertaining stuff that people post and the, the great distraction that the show can be sometimes, uh, but also just how people really do come along and make comments about uh, our guests and episodes and they support the people that, uh, that come on and and spend time with us. And it, it really has been something that, you know, there are times when Alan and I are both just crazy busy, but we can't wait to do this because the listeners are just so amazing. Yeah. So that is something that I am really thankful for as well. Well, and I'll add one here that was not out on Twitter already for the Thanksgiving week, but four years ago, this knucklehead on this side of the microphone had a wild idea for a podcast and decided there's only one other knucklehead that I think could manage <laughs> to be just as dumb to say, sure. Yeah. That you found like the right fun. guy. That was you. And so I'm really <laughs> thankful that you and I crossed paths a few years before that and led to the spark. That is the wilder ride. Absolutely. Absolutely. That I agree. And, you know, uh, sometimes you listen to podcasts and you wonder how well people get along off the air and, uh, I'm thankful that I can can sincerely say that you're one of my best friends and that I enjoy doing this every week. So, Ditto. Um, that, and you know, the that cool thing is a blessing, even if we're missing an episode because of a week goes by or because of a guest conflict or our conflicts. I don't know that a day goes by if 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 it's a day, it's only one that we don't text message, send a oh. voice message. We're always chatting with one another. Yeah, I think we've had a an ongoing conversation for five years. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, just it may change subjects for a minute or two, but well, we but, both have very similar senses of humor. We're both we can both be snarky. We can appreciate snarkiness and sarcasm and wit. Yep. And uh and we and we both, yeah, I mean, hey, we get along. We get along very yeah. well. Yes, definitely. You're in my top tier, bud. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you tier too, is right? very small at the top. <laughs> There's not very many up there. <laughs> well, and the older you get, the more you you know, you kind of have friends and then you have friends and it doesn't diminish those other people, but you realize the people who are there in your life all the time and you really have an appreciation for those folks. Yeah, so. really do. Well, I know there's a, there's going to be a weirdness here because with the guests we've got coming on, um, I know him. I already interviewed him on the radio. So I think you're going to actually kind of kick back, relax. I'm going to drive the interview and then he can't hang out with us. So we're going to get him all knocked out. And then you and I will pick up right where we left off with like where we leave off with most guests. Uh, No movie, though, this week because of the Thanksgiving holiday. Forgot to post this something. So we're going to bypass the movie review. Yeah, we'll be back with another movie review next week. Fear not. Actually, I think we're going to be we're going to be really close to the end pretty soon. Yeah, we're getting there. We've got just a couple more guests and we're done for the year. And take take the take the holidays off to be with family and friends. Um, So. I'll let you put it on mute, kick back, relax. We have got an author who used to be a high school teacher and a coach who has a side career in motivating teams, consulting with companies on how to be good leaders, good good team members, how to develop that kind of leadership, and has grown a second career 
to where he has now retired from teaching and coaching and is full-time, has a new book out. We're going to talk about the books that he's already put out. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for Sean Glaze. Sean, welcome to the show. How are you? Man, I'm waiting for the crowd to scream and the confetti to fall. That was pretty nice. Oh, oh, Thanks, Alan. Oh, they're, they're screaming for you. You just don't hear it right <laughs> now. You'll hear it next week. <laughs> How you doing? I am fantastic, man. I'm thrilled to be here with you guys. All right, let's get to it. Um, Walt is going to take a back seat on this. I'm going to take it. I'm going to take us right through the interview. Um, first, I, what we do here is we kind of do the throwback to the old Johnny Carson days of it's about the guest. It's not about worrying about politics or, or, or divisive topics. It's about what makes the person interesting and why we have you on. So we always say, let's set the DeLorean and in, in, into, you know, up to 88. Let's go to the way back machine and say, when did you first start off your career actually in coaching before we get to what you're doing now with team building? Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate you teeing that up for me, man. I uh, uh, it'll it'll be a pretty smooth transition, kind of segue from that first job as a coach to now as a kind of speaker and author, uh, because it's really that background in coaching basketball that gave me the the really painful, difficult, frustrating experiences that now I want to help leaders in all kinds of industries to try and stay away from. I actually started off, and I wasn't going to be a teacher or a coach. Alan, I went to school at Georgia Southern. I was majoring in English, and I was going to be an attorney, and I played too much, and my GPA did not allow me to get into the University of Georgia, so I'm graduating with a degree in English, and I actually went and visited my old soccer coach, And as I'm sitting in the office waiting for him to come up to the office from where he was in the gym, the principal of my old high school walks in, says, hey, Sean, what are you doing? Well, Miss Jackson just graduated a degree in English, not really sure, probably going to go into sales or something for a year or two and reapply to law school. English? You know, we need English teachers, Sean. And I laughed her off and said the, the kind of polite hellos. And a couple of days later, I called her back. Hey, are you serious? I could teach for a year, right? And I actually went to Georgia State, took all the teaching courses that you needed to at least get my foot in the door as a provisional certificate. Mm -hmm. I think I made about $16,000 that first year uh, (laughs) when I was still working on my student teaching stuff and in the classroom at Pebble Brook High School. And in the midst of that very first year, Alan, uh, I was asked by the guy that was the basketball coach there when I had been in school, uh, hey, would you help out with ninth grade basketball? Well, I didn't know anything about basketball. I played soccer coming up. So I can teach you the game. I know who you are. know your character. You'll do a great job working with the kids. We need a body. Would you be interested? Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and that began my journey. And I actually had some pretty good success that first four or five years as an assistant. First at Pebble Brook and later at McEachern. Had some pretty good athletes and good kids, and they played hard, and we won some games. And then I got pretty – confident. We'll say confident instead of arrogant. Uh, And I thought I knew what I was doing and I started applying for head basketball positions. In my very first year as a head basketball coach, Alan, uh, full of energy and excitement and enthusiasm and all that stuff. You think you're going to go in and change the world because you know how to do things better and had all this great strategy. And I face planted and we won five games out of 26. And, uh, And that was the beginning of my journey to look for the things that at the time I didn't know I wasn't doing. Well, let's talk a little bit about the sport in and of itself. My girls grew up playing soccer. I learned soccer. A lot of a lot of American football people look at soccer and go, I don't understand. I don't get off sides. It doesn't make any sense to me. What got you into soccer? Was it just because, I mean, it's much more popular now. But when you were getting into it, it wasn't nearly as popular. And I'm not trying to age you. Yeah, wait a second was, here, buddy. Yeah, when I was growing age up, of dinosaurs. You and I are probably in that same <laughs> age range, the Gen X crowd. Soccer was around, but it's not nearly as big as it is now. No, actually got involved, uh, you know, playing youth soccer, I think just to, uh, you know, to kind of keep me busy and a little bit in shape. And, and I think I was a little bit more enthusiastic and competitive than I was skilled. Uh, but I played, you know, all throughout the, uh, the eighties, a young guy went to Pebble Brook and played soccer in high school. And, uh, even when I was at Georgia Southern, 
uh, you realize when you walk on and you kind of see some of the talent there that, you know, in 1988, I had no business being on a college soccer field. Uh, so I did not play any sports in college. But, uh, yeah, that was something that uh, I don't know what it was that got me into. I do remember years ago, and this is something that you and I and, and maybe others of our uh, of our age might. I do remember going and seeing the Atlanta Chiefs play years ago. Uh, and so that was something that I kind of enjoyed. But I think that was after I already gotten involved in the sport. All right. So now I got to ask the question, as you learn the game of basketball, there's a difference. You're going from nine players per side to five and you're, but it's still a team passing kind of sport where you're moving simultaneously on offense and defense, depending which way the ball and the, you're moving. So there is that similarity to soccer, but did you learn anything from soccer that you could leverage into basketball? Not as much as I would probably be wise to have acknowledged or to have been aware of at the time. What really made me fall in love with basketball and why I eventually gave up the the soccer whistle and being outside wasn't just the weather. Obviously, you're starting off in Georgia. You're playing, you know, from January and February, you're practicing and it's cold and it's wet and I'm doing goalie drills on the ground and it's just frigid and you're miserable. But uh you know, the gym is always 72 and sunny. So that was probably a little bit, but I really fell in love with basketball because it is so much more of an intensity. And I thought that at the time as a coach, if I was going to invest myself in not just working with young people and athletes and developing them as people, but if I'm going to look to hopefully have an impact on a game and a program, I really felt like as a basketball coach, you have more impact on the outcome of games and developing talent than maybe you do as a high school soccer coach. And that was something that uh, I fell in love with the individual improvement with the X's and O's that were involved with, with uh, basketball. And that's probably the reason that, that I kind of switched gears and, and left soccer uh, and left my cleats kind of behind <laughs> in my youth and started to, uh, to focus more in basketball in terms of the coaching and leadership. Well, there's definitely something to be said about the big three sports here in America, football, baseball, basketball. Those do tend to get more people in the stands. They are technically more American sports. And so there is going to be a lot more, I guess, prestige as well as all scrutiny around the sport. Yeah, absolutely. And and as you get into coaching at whatever level, you know, you got you know, the, the middle school volunteer coaches who still hear it from parents and fans. And so as a high school varsity coach, you can imagine, you know, there's there's certainly always those uh, those voices of, of concern or doubt or uh, or different opinions. But uh, it was something that I really look back on and enjoy. And as I said, you know, the first few years. Uh, I thought that I was probably better than I was. And I think that uh, that very first year of really failing as a leader is what led me to all that I'm trying to do now in terms of, you know, being somebody that helps to, to give information to others who are now where I used to be as a leader. You know, I, and I don't know the exact number I should because I bring up this analogy a lot because I think failure is an important part of learning, period, in anything. And I know there's the story of Thomas Edison trying to invent the light bulb. And he had some 900 iterations and someone had said, Tom, what are you doing? You've made 900 attempts to make a light bulb and they've all failed. Face it. It's, it's useless. And he goes, no, I've learned 900 ways how not to make the light bulb. Yeah. And he used that as a mechanism of saying, you're learning always what to try differently. The only failure in my mind is when you stop trying. Yeah, that sense of complacency, of giving up, of not wanting to move forward and risk the frustration and risk the opportunity to succeed is something that I think uh, keeps more people from from summiting mountains than the actual mountain is they see it and they become kind of cowards instead of climbers. And, and to be willing to risk and to fail, I think, is what sets that man in the arena apart. You know, certainly another uh, another quote, but uh, but as a as a coach that failure was something that that caused me to finally look in the mirror where I hadn't before uh, and realize that where I was doing a number of things really well in terms of the strategy and the X's and O's and the individual skill stuff, uh, I had a long way to go to really become a good coach. For the audience that's listening, because uh, I know we have a lot of international listeners, we have a lot of folks in the UK, Europe, uh, in, in the Middle East, 
we're we're not going to talk all sports because <laughs> that's not the point of the in- interview, but it is the basis by which you learned team building and approaching the objective with ma- varying personalities. And so we're going to get to that. So let's talk mm-hmm. about in sports you do have to manage personalities more than just the game. If it was just robots, it'd be a lot easier to program your players to do what they're supposed to. You know, and that is such an important point. And I really think, Alan, that there are so many leaders, regardless of industry or or sport, in whatever circumstance, who sometimes focus upon that strategic side because it is easier. Strategy is something that even organizations will pour into strategy and really focus upon strategic ideas. And they neglect, like I did, all of the culture that is the thing that allows your strategy to succeed. And uh, and, and that was really the, the aha moment for me as a coach is we're in that locker room uh, And I'm sure that leaders have seen the same thing in conference rooms and sales rooms and classrooms across the the country and and throughout wherever. But uh, but I remember at the end of that very first game or very last game that we had played my first season as a head coach, the kids are walking out one by one individually. And it was my assistant coach who's standing beside me who says, coach, you know, we're going to have a better program. We got to actually have a whole lot better relationships. And that was something I'd completely neglected. I'd had my head in the sand and had not paid any attention at all to the people inside the uniforms, to, to those personalities, to, to you know, pushing buttons based upon people's backgrounds and beliefs and you know, desires. And I hadn't made an investment in the people that first year because I was so focused upon the strategy. And, and that was something that when we really made that intentional decision to be different and to be focused upon the relationships instead of, you know, just the rebounds, uh, that was something that really allowed us to, to be tremendously better the second year and in future seasons because culture had such an incredible impact on the behavior and the effort and the morale of the people I was leading. All right. The questions I'm going to ask are going to lead me up to where you are today. But let me ask this because we're Gen Xers. I was in high school in the 80s, went to college in the late 80s and into the early 90s. We used to keep score. We knew who the winners were. We understood that you had to work hard to win and you didn't get an an award (laughs) just for showing up. You had to do more. Right. You've been coaching through the Gen X, Gen Gen Y millennial. Now we've got Gen Z. And I think there's been a huge shift in how those quote human resources, whether it's a soccer player, a basketball player, a football player, or an employee, huge differences in what they think is important. Yeah. I I had this conversation about a week ago, and I think that it's fascinating when you consider the shift that society has made over the years. And, And certainly that idea of competitiveness you look across the landscape in any sport, you still have unbelievably competitive people. They're in business, unbelievably competitive people. And I think competition brings out our best and obviously sometimes brings out our worst. Uh, But that idea of moving from competition to only cooperation, I think ends up diminishing the value of both. And I think that what you've seen recently is in an attempt to keep people from having those negative feelings. I think you know, one of the best things that happened to me was to have to face plant and to fail because when you fail, that you learn how to pick yourself up and be better the next time. And I think when we don't give kids or adults or people in any circumstance an opportunity to be bad, then they lose that opportunity to be proud of when they get better. You know, growing up, I've always heard whether it was priests during the sermon or preachers during the homily or whatever, saying, you know, you don't know what's the light if you've not seen the dark. You don't know what's up if you've never been down. Mm -hmm. And I feel there's a disservice, as you kind of alluded to, when we soften everything to try to prevent you from ever feeling bad or down or depressed or unwanted, which we get, those are all negative, When you suppress that, how does anybody understand when they've actually achieved or done something to stand out? Yeah, and I think there's two things that happen. The first is uh, 
you diminish that competitive drive if, if you're assuaging people's emotions and saying it's okay to lose if. And certainly, you, you know, losing is something that we're all going to do at some point if we're competing. I think competition leads to individual improvement and development. And that's going to be something that you want. And then you need to cooperate in order to be able to compete well in things that really matter. I don't think you can accomplish anything worthwhile just as an individual. And that's one of the things that I think is the other part of that equation that doesn't get talked about enough is, is it's not just the move away from celebrating winners and, and encouraging those who didn't win, who didn't compete well in that particular iteration to get better and to drive them and motivate them to want to you know, succeed the next time. I think what happens is, um, You've seen over the last few years specifically in the name and image and likeness is only going to exacerbate that in colleges is there's a move away from the team mentality to the me mentality. And I think that uh, you'll continue to see those types of distracting things pull away from what I think sport was originally intended to uh, hopefully bring out. It's not just my best, but how can I be a valuable part of something larger and more significant than myself. Yeah. The phrase that we always hear is the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And that's what you're trying to achieve that you may have wonderful individual players, but there's something magic that happens when they're all working together as a team versus as individuals. Right. And, and if I'm, whether it's basketball or business, if I'm in it just for myself, then that talent eventually creates a toxic environment where others aren't going to enjoy or, or produce or perform as well. All right. So let's talk about moving through your, your high school career as a coach and as a teacher, as somebody who is a mentor and a guide, because we talk about high school coaches. Yeah. Winning is great. Everyone loves to win, but it's all also about developing character and discipline and the, making good people when they grow up. Right. While you were doing all of that, when did you find the, the calling, if you will, to start writing about leadership, about what makes a leader or what works toward building leadership? I remember the very first book that I wrote. It was something that I honestly had to write because it was a story and, and the content within the story that continued to kind of bubble up within me because there were things that I would share with our athletes and, and, and those teammates that I had the, the benefit of, of helping to develop, not just as players, but as people, um, that I wanted to make sure they carried with them beyond the court and the locker room. And, and so that first story is now called The Unexpected Leader, and it's about how a player can lead, even when he does have a title. And I think that's certainly applicable in business, because you can certainly see that leadership is far less about title and position and far more about passion and impact. And if you really care about changing your environment, you can have an impact that does change the environment instead of allowing that environment to kind of put out the fire that, that you're carrying. And, and so that story of, of a player and his impact on the team, regardless of some of the issues with, with coaches or others that are you kind of there around the program and that story was what I wanted to give to kids, not just on my team, but to athletes you know, around the country, and it got you know pretty well received. And it was not long after that that I really, I think, specifically for me, that that uh, maybe spark began to recognize that my desire and my passion, and maybe you know that mission that I wanted to attach myself to, wasn't just about basketball. Obviously, but it was basketball for me was a tool to develop people and there was a larger world out there than just the gym that I was working in. And, and how could I actually take some of those lessons that I'd learned as a basketball coach and leading programs and developing people and building more positive cultures. And how could I help others do that in their circumstances so they could have not just better days, but better results. So at what point were you sort of doing dual careers? You're the, the, the coach, the teacher, and on the side <laughs> you're writing and thinking about, these ideas that can be leveraged maybe elsewhere outside of the, the hard court. When did you start finding yourself fracturing in kind of like parallel careers? I was so blessed, Alan, to have a series of three or four really high quality understanding and encouraging principles at the high schools that I worked at. And so um, at, at the last four schools, where I worked and that was, you know, going from one job to the next and coaching, you know, girls and taking over a guy's program, et cetera. 
uh, each of the principals in those conversations in the interview, I would explain some of the the, the side job that I had and, and the fact that, you know, sometimes I, I may have an event that would cause me to miss a day. Is that something that would be an issue if, as long as it didn't obviously interfere with the priority, which is classroom and locker room and leading program, et cetera. And in every instance, they were so very encouraging and supportive. And I think that they saw better than I did how much better that made me, not just in the classrooms, but in the hallways, in the locker rooms, because ultimately, again, I think that I have absolutely benefited from so many people who didn't even realize they were mentoring me at the time, people who have poured into me and helped me to be better. And so that's something that, you know, I think that when we're blessed, we want to be a blessing to others. And and that really has been kind of what's driven me is not just with the kids that I've had in my programs, but in any circumstance, whether it's through the books or through the speaking events or through the team building events uh, with, with corporate organizations or whomever around the country. You know, that's always been my opportunity to give back and to, to share some of those lessons and principles that I think make people more successful and more positively impactful, regardless of circumstance. All right. So you and I had a chance to talk before, and I, I mentioned to you that I have a background in psychology. My, when I went to college, my degree, I thought that was what I was going to do. I was going to go out there and solve all the people's problems <laughs> in the world. And I found myself gravitating toward a lot of the leadership and group dynamic side of the aisle. I thought that was really fascinating. And I mentioned the four parts of forming a group, and you knew them exactly as I was saying them. And that's the, the forming, the storming, the norming, and then hopefully the performing. Right. While you're performing as a basketball coach and you're, and you're going through all your, your, your development with players, you're working on this side career. At what point did you start really pushing the idea that you are a consultant now? That you could come in and you felt the confidence to tell a corporation or tell people in business let me tell you what you're doing wrong or what you could do better. <laughs> well, and that's probably not the phraseology that I needed to use, right? Uh, and, and unfortunately, that is probably a phrase that I used on my players way too often as a young coach. And, and uh, that's something we'll talk about, I'm sure, with staying coachable is making that shift from the command and control to the being a whole lot more of a connector and staying curious. And, uh, but yeah, I think that... Uh, when I started to see the impact that some of those activities and some of that focus on culture had on our program and on our kids and on our team, that's something that I originally uh, reached out to around the Southeast to some athletic programs. And I started working with some other athletic programs. And from there, I actually sent out probably, and this is well over a decade ago, I think I sent out quite possibly the ugliest flyer in the history of mankind that I had put together on whatever computer and you know, <laughs> sent out from whatever print just after internet had probably opened up, um, but actually got three or four responses back for me to go and then work with school faculties um, because that was something I was familiar with. And it was in the midst of a couple of those conversations that people in those events would suggest to me, hey, my wife or my husband or my friend owns this company or works in this company, they would really benefit from. And and that was kind of the aha moment for me to obviously begin to shift because uh, athletic teams and schools have, uh, have budgets and people who can benefit from. But certainly in terms of corporate opportunities, that opened the door to a little bit more travel and a little bit more impact on a larger scale. So let's talk about those four pieces and how that kind of evolves and well, maybe kind of grows together because now you're starting to figure out how to piece people together and talk about how do groups come together? How do they learn how to get through some of their differences, how they have those internal battles, just like on the field, just like on the hard court, you've got personality conflicts, but at some point, if they can get past it, they can form and then hopefully can work together toward an objective. So. How did you start leveraging that idea of going forward? And and were people receptive to the idea that groups go through these four steps? Yeah. You know, and, and when I've worked with organizations or with leaders uh, or, or even in, you know, one-off events as a team building facilitator or speaker, I very seldom will talk about that kind of four stages of team building and going through the, the, the forming the team and how the storming occurs, some of the issues and kind of working through some of that conflict before you eventually get to the performing. 
what I would talk with groups about, and specifically groups of leaders who were looking to have a toolbox or a sequence or a system where they could turn their individuals or their group of people who are working in proximity into a really committed, connected team, is I talk about the acronym GREAT. And if you want a great team, there are five things. There's a five-part recipe sequence. And just like a phone number has a great sequence, the same thing. You have to have a great team follows this sequence of the first thing you need to do when you're forming a team, even if it's already an established team, but you're really wanting to establish the buy-in and commitment and connections, they're going to give you a chance for that strategy to succeed. The first thing you've got to have is a compelling common goal. So we'll build off that cheesy acronym, great, G is for goal. And that compelling common goal, that's why you're there. And if people don't know why they're there, they're not going to do as much while they're there or they'll come up with their own individual reasons instead of our shared compelling common goal. So that's the first thing is to really clarify what is that goal. And the second thing that is unbelievably important that I think is oftentimes ignored by leaders is you need to connect to each other. You need to build relationships and connections of those people who are going to work together to achieve that compelling common goal. And that's where oftentimes collaboration breaks down is if we don't have a connection, if we've not built a relationship, I'm far less likely to reach out and share or request information with you. And so the reason that you have silos isn't that silos are a bad thing. Silos are a sign that people have connected and built some type of strong relationship based upon a shared challenge or a shared goal. What you want to do is you want to take those silos or those different divisions that have built connections and you want to build connections among them as well. But that takes time and intention. And I think that if you have those first two parts of the recipe, if you have that compelling common goal and people recognize why they're there, and if you have connections with and understand the the values and the strengths and the background and desires and challenges of those people that you're working with, those first two make the next three possible to focus on. Okay. Well, next logical question is let's go ahead and finish the acronym. <laughs> You've got me hanging so if, here. It's like the end of so a cliffhanger. I got a G, next episode. Absolutely. So if you go from G for the goals and R for relationships, the next three are E for expectations. You need to clarify what are our standards going to be as a team? How are we not rules? You know, drill sergeants and young coaches like myself had rules, and rules often lead to rebellion, right? Uh, And so if you don't have those relationships, you're going to have a little bit of pushback. Uh, So instead of rules, I think teams benefit from clarifying what are we going to commit to as a standard? What are those four or five things that we're going to say that we're going to do and hold each other accountable for? And those are maybe the values that you define as behaviors. But I think that clarifying, here's how we're going to communicate as a team, specifically in a situation like we've had over the last 18 months. There have been a number of teams that I've worked with that have people who have been remote that are really burned out because there's been no clarity about how and when we're going to communicate and collaborate and share emails and when am I actually on the clock and when am I not on the clock? How are we going to define those things? And so after you've set those expectations, A is going to be for accountability. And I've got a different take on accountability than I think most people, because as a young coach, I thought that accountability was consequences. And yeah, you can celebrate and reward, but you can also punish and make sure that people understand, again, that carrot and stick mentality. And I think that accountability, if you see it as only consequences, that only leads to compliance. And a compliant group of workers isn't going to ever perform as well as a committed group of teammates. And you create commitment when you see that accountability is far more about empathy than it is about consequences. If I care about our goal, and I care about the people that I'm working with, then I'm going to be personally accountable. And I'm going to think about how what I do has a ripple impact on the goal and the people that I care about. So again, those first two things, the goals and relationships really are are unbelievably vital in making the next three possible. So set expectations. I got I to, I want to interject something here because yeah. one of the things when you start talking about the way you look at accountability, uh, when I'm thinking about teams is when I think, People feel valuable when they feel they're empowered mm-hmm. to do their jobs. And I think when you're saying, well, well, I'm holding you accountable, I, I think the flip side is I'm giving you the reins to do what you have to do because I'm trusting you to do it. Right. I think that's a lot more positive 
than to say, I'm going to micromanage and tell you how to do your job. So very important. That idea of autonomy is one of the things that I think people absolutely crave is to feel like they have the freedom and the responsibility to make decisions that are going to impact the results that they're responsible for. All right. So we have the accountability. We're, we're down to the T. So T, I think, is the one that you see actually people get burned out because of. And when people come to me as leaders of teams, organizations, and we're dealing with burnout, we need somebody to come in and help us with morale. Well, again, you don't want to put a Band-Aid on something. My job is to come in and pretend that, that you know, spending 30 minutes or doing one activity is going to solve the world's problems. I think that a team building event, whether it's a half day or a full day, or even during something virtually to create some connections is a catalyst event that needs to be followed up by consistent behaviors and activities and opportunities where leaders do focus upon those connections that make their culture work. Um, But I think that specifically burnout occurs when you don't give people a chance to pause and appreciate the progress that they've made and to feel appreciated for the efforts they gave that allowed that progress to occur. So there's two things that I think leaders really need to focus on. And again, T obviously is toasts or thanks or showing appreciation, but specifically in the midst of the circumstances we've been in over the last year, year and a half, I think people are working, whether it's in person or remotely, and they don't always feel seen. And all that we do is valuable, but we don't always feel that maybe it's as visible as we would like. And people want to feel recognized and seen for the efforts they're making for all the things that they're juggling. And uh, sometimes remote work ends up being more stressful because you're juggling so many other balls there in the midst of your know, home and, and stresses and different ways that you're kind of being pulled. So think as a leader, what can you do to pause and to first acknowledge the progress you've made? People want to feel that they've made progress. That's a huge part of morale in any organization is showing progress on the way to the goal you've defined. But the other part of that is, do your people feel appreciated for the efforts they've made? Because engagement, Alan, I think is nothing more than how much do your people care about the results they're contributing to? And if you can help them connect those dots and let them feel appreciated for their contributions, They continue to fight and to work hard and to be a committed part of that team. Let me tell you, I can honestly add to this conversation because I've had to help younger members of the, from what I do in, in radio or performance. uh, We live in a culture where you only will hear sometimes from a boss when you've done something wrong. (laughs) Right. And it's a very belittling, devaluing, demoralizing environment over time when you never hear even one positive reinforcement. And I think so many people feel like, well, it's going well. I don't need to say anything. I'll only say something when I don't like what's happening. But the impression to the employee or the person or whatever is, oh, okay, I never know if I'm doing anything right because I only hear when I'm doing something wrong. So very true. And I think that that was something, honestly, that I was painfully guilty of as a young coach. And even as as I began to take other jobs and again, you're pushing for those wins and pushing to be successful as a program and for kids to get a little bit better and to have their own opportunities beyond high school. Sometimes you don't take the time to pause and appreciate the progress they've made and let them feel seen and let them feel appreciated for those contributions that they're making to something larger than themselves. Because if what gets rewarded usually gets repeated, it's my job to make sure I'm rewarding people before we get to the banquet. And I think that as a leader, it's really important. Do you have those milestone moments along the path where you can let your people feel seen and appreciated? Because you know, it's one of those weird them. things. We, there's so many studies in psychology about the, the reward centers of the brain on, you know, tests with mice from as, you know, in the sixties talking about the, the pleasure centers of the brain and they'll, hit the bar as many times as they can, because if they're being stimulated in a positive way, they'll keep doing it. They'll keep doing it. They'll do it. Absolutely. And yet we, for some reason, there seems to be something in our culture, something in our current age that that there's a resistance to praise. And the funniest thing is growing up in a business world, before I moved into radio, I was with IBM. I was part of a large corporation and I had gotten a book early on in my career, which was great, which was a hundred ways to give somebody a bonus without it costing a dime. 
And it was things like saying thank you, making sure you said something in a, in a meeting that was positive, putting a card or a post-it saying, great job, hope you have a wonderful day. Little tiny things that made the employee feel like you were thinking enough about them to take time to say something, write something, do something that didn't necessarily cost money. It was about the value that they felt was coming to them from their boss. Absolutely. Well, you think about the great resignation and the people that are leaving for various reasons, certainly, but people normally leave managers, not organizations. And when they leave that manager, it's normally for exactly what you're talking about because they don't feel that that manager sees or cares about those efforts. And, and again, whether it's basketball or business, I think that leaders and coaches and, and people in positions of authority can really benefit from the point that you're making because if the only time that you reach out with an email or with a call is when something needs to be corrected, if you're only given rear view criticisms about you should have done it this way, then people are going to eventually stop wanting to answer that email or answer that phone. And it's true for friends, just like it is for teammates or for coworkers or those that we lead. How important is it for us to reach out sometimes and send a text? Right? Hey, just thinking about you, what's going on? Because when you get a call from that friend who only reaches out when they need something, eventually you start to ignore that call. Right. You know, what's funny. And I, and I, I have a podcast I do with some friends of mine over in the UK where we're just trying to teach people what we've learned. We, we say very quickly, we're not psychologists. We're not trained. We're not counselors. We don't want anybody. But this is what we've learned. And, and one of the things that I find like just amazing is how just words of affirmation are so powerful. And yet it's the least used, at least in my estimation, the least used tool in the leader's toolbox. In my experience, what I see, what I hear from other people, I hear so many people say, well, I don't even know if I'm doing my job well. Nobody's yelling at me. So I guess, and I'm still there, I guess I'm okay. But there's that sense of right. doubt. There's that sense of, am I even doing it right? And, and I find myself weird having to sometimes tell somebody, hey, trust me. You'll hear if you did something wrong, so assume you're doing it okay. But that's really hard to develop internally, yeah. this idea, well, okay, it must be okay because nobody's bothering to tell me anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that's not, the, uh, that's not the, the type of dynamic you want to set up on a team is, you know, silence is okay. I think silence can be unbelievably painful and deadly to teams. And, and I think that, you know, that idea of, you know, asking people, when's the last time that you said thank you to, and then fill in the blank. Who are those people in your organization who you know are valuable, but maybe don't feel visible? What can you do to give them that sense of value and contribution and impact that you know that they have, but you don't always acknowledge? Uh, that's so very powerful. So again, that kind of finishes out our, our great acronym. But yeah, those, those important thanks have such an incredible impact on team dynamics. What's crazy to me is uh, most of those things we're talking about don't cost the company a dime. Right. You know? And I know a lot of people say, oh, I just want a bonus. I just like, it's amazing how a one time $1,000 or $5,000 or even $10,000, you feel good for that moment. But then if you go right back to the daily grind, you just feel like, oh, I got rewarded, but I'm still not sure if I'm. It's amazing how words of affirmation on a consistent basis will keep you feeling good about what you're doing. And, and I think organizations do this a lot is, is it's, it's harder. And again, that sense of empathy, right? Mm -hmm. you know, it, it's Absolutely. easier sometimes to argue for, we need more money for a recognition program instead of we need to be more intentional as leaders about recognizing our people creatively. Because it's the creative thing. Now, certainly sometimes that may cost a little bit, but that idea of implementing a program where we're going to reward people for, you know, five years of service or one year, I think that those milestones are things that you can acknowledge. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it, it's not just longevity that we should be celebrating. It's contribution and it's impact and it's empathy. And it's, it's all those things that if you're really aware, I think one of the most important things that a leader can be is aware. Are you aware of, what's happening, not just, you know, with you, but with those people that you're responsible for. Do you know what they're coming from at home? Do you know what they're going home? Do you know what some of those other challenges are that are maybe on their mind? Do you have an idea of what it is that they're going to be affected by that was coming? And the more that you stay curious, the more you can make a, a meaningful connection and build a relationship. I think your job as a leader is to help your people build relationships 
that are strong enough when the time comes, they know they're appreciated and know they're valued. So when the time comes, you've got to have a difficult conversation. You've got a relationship that is really strong enough to support the weight of truth when you have to have those tough conversations. All right. So you mentioned the title of the first book, and I wanted to have this sort of background detail conversation to kind of work our, our way through to where you are right now. The Unexpected Leader, which is what you, your first book was about. We, t- we talked about all these principles on how to be better with a team, how you can put these things in place, the great acronym. But one of the things I learned is sometimes leaders just show up. It's not that they're assigned. It's not like they're a task. Sometimes you have to watch for the people that just have that certain something. It's so hard to quantify, but they become more charismatic. They're more influential. They have the ability to kind of wrap people around them. So how do you define the unexpected leader? Well, I I think I've been a little confusing. The unexpected leader is absolutely about how do you lead without a title? What is that impact you can have in in changing your environment based upon your commitment? Rapid Teamwork was that second book. When I really was intentional about what can I share with team leaders that will give them that, that, that sequence, that system where they can really focus upon culture, which is what I had needed to do when I was a young leader, because I had all the X's and O's, the strategy is something I'd solely focused upon. I was really focused upon learning strategy to the neglect of the culture that obviously sabotaged my strategy. And so rapid teamwork was, you know, strategy is very seldom the reason that teams underachieve. Culture is the reason that teams underachieve. And so that rapid teamwork was about the great acronym. And I think that what, what you find is, if you can focus upon those first two things, if you can build unity and energy with connecting to a compelling common goal and being intentional about that and connecting people to each other, that makes people leaders. And whether you have a position or not, if you care about those two things, you're going to have a positive impact on your team. Okay. Gotcha. So, and you and I had chatted about this before when you were in the station with me, there's a big difference between being the boss and being a leader. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think, uh, you know, there are people who are leaders in organizations and in teams uh, who do not have the formal title, who do not have uh, the position or the authority that has been bestowed upon them, but they have influence because they have demonstrated, they've built trust because they've demonstrated that they care about the goal and they care about the people and they've taken initiative and they do what they're expected to and beyond. And they become those winning teammates that other people want to work with. All right. So let's move to, and, and I don't want to give all your stuff away because we're going to talk about your books and how people can engage <laughs> with you and find them. But it seems like we're making this natural progression. You you moved from, you know, it's not about the title. It's, a, it's, it's about learning how to create a different culture, recognizing the culture in book two. We moved to the 10 commandments of winning teammates. So we're seeing an evolution here where you're starting to build on your life lessons yourself. Yeah, well, you know, when I started to transition to not only doing some of the team building stuff, but what can I share in terms of a conference environment as a keynote speaker? What what are some of those lessons that rather than providing activities and debriefing discussions in a team building setting, what can I provide in terms of a really meaningful and impactful keynote that's going to share stories and ideas that are going to make people change how they saw their role in an organization. And so rapid teamwork is something that certainly could be delivered to team leaders, but most conferences aren't just management and leaders. Most conferences are going to be those frontline employees, those coworkers who are really having the impact every single day and having interactions, not just with coworkers, but with clients. And so one of the things I had noticed as a coach and certainly later working with organizations, is that regardless of circumstance, the principles that make somebody valuable to a team are absolutely the same. So whether it's in a basketball court or whether it's in a conference room or in whatever setting or industry you can define, the principles of what does it mean to be a valuable teammate, I think, are exactly the same. And I saw that there was one particular player that I had the pleasure of coaching, uh, uh, about 10 years ago now, that really demonstrated it because she wasn't a very talented kid. She, you know, 
I'd heard, you know, all along from the kids, you know, we kind of ask them who's the best teammate you ever, you know, played with. And, and so that kind of helped us early on as a coaching staff to help to identify those things that we're going to commit to doing as teammates. Mm-hmm. And I have this one time where I asked that question and, you know, I don't know, seven out of the 12 kids wrote down the exact same name. It was somebody that was there in the program. And Gracie was an incredible teammate. She wasn't an incredibly talented kid. She wasn't a great shooter. She wasn't a great ball handler. She was just an incredible teammate. And all the things that I saw in her were the things that would come up when I talked to leaders in organizations and in corporations and in, and in teams outside of athletics. Things like, you know, they're taking personal responsibility for the team results. They're going to connect with and care about and encourage others. They're going to show appreciation and thanks. They're going to respect the clock and the calendar. They're going to stay coachable. And basically, there's this list of 10 categories that when you check those 10 things off, you become somebody who is a valuable member of any organization because you make that place better because the impact you have. And if you're a talented person and you don't have those traits, oftentimes you become toxic talent. So to be a winning teammate is somebody that has those traits that regardless of talent, you can have an unbelievably positive impact on your organization. Because I think, yeah, let's talk about it because we've heard that. We've heard about uh, like in the NFL or, or sports tends to be where you see it more, where you have a stunning athlete and you hear how it's a toxic locker room, that the athlete doesn't work well with everyone and makes everyone resentful, yet they're performing every week. In fact, they're doing stunning things on the field and then they're like almost flaunting it, creating a negativity in the locker room. Yeah. And I think that you see this in organizations, not just in basketball, but absolutely in business, whether it's a sales team or a project team where somebody is talented and is knowledgeable and is skilled at whatever that is that they do well. But because they don't exhibit these traits, they end up being a detriment to their team and they really place a ceiling on their team's performance because one talented person is very seldom going to outperform and will never outperform over a consistent amount of time, a group of people who are maybe moderately talented, but far more committed to that compelling common goal. So the book, The Ten Commandments of Winning Teammates, is really a great guide for someone to say, am I doing all I should as part of the team or could I do better? And, And I think that's a question that drives the book, but a question that is really powerful for us to ask ourselves, you know, who is the best teammate you ever had? And when you think about that question, you identify somebody that had a really positive impact on you. And most of the time, they probably weren't the most talented person on that team, regardless of athletics. You can be a team in terms of a family. You can have a team at a church. You have a team professionally, certainly. But those people that that would get identified in the events that I would hold, when you ask that question, you know, really had a positive impact on people's lives, not just their performance. And they were examples that others wanted to emulate. And so when you think about those traits that you valued in others, well, those are the things that your people want you to display when you come to work. And if we can adopt some of those traits that we know are winning teammate traits, then we end up being better for our team and our team ends up benefiting from that. So let's go ahead and jump now to where we are today with your most recent (laughs) book just came out because I thought it was an interesting premise. I think sometimes people feel like I've gone through in my earlier days of my career, team building, retrospective, coaching, but now I've been winning. I've been doing what I need to do. I feel like I've got it all down. Am I still coachable? And staying coachable. Thank you very much for teeing that up. Staying coachable is the most recent book that just, uh, just published and and it, it had a nice launch and has been really well received. Uh, and it is actually built off of one of those traits of winning teammates. You know, the winning teammates stay coachable. They want to be better. They want to improve. They want to develop. And I would have conversations with people when I would come off the stage or after you kind of sharing the book in an event. They say, well, all right, which one of these do you think is the most important? And I used to always answer, Alan, I think the most important thing you can do is to take personal responsibility for team results, to really be less about me, more about I'm here to make the team better, to see the larger picture. And I believe that for a few years until I began to have conversations and internally 
kind of began to consider the impact of being coachable because I did have conversations with leaders of people who, again, you've heard this phrase, you know, uncoachable kids become unmanageable adults. Mm. And I think that's very true. And like you said, we're all coachable to a point. The reason you've reached your level of success is because you were coachable. The reason our listeners have reached their present level of success is because they were coachable up to a point where they became complacent. And I think it's very easy at times for us to stop climbing and set up camp. And instead of reaching that summit or going to the next mountain, we kind of get comfortable and that complacency sets in and we become less coachable. And, and, and when I use that term coachable, it's funny because I'll, I'll obviously you kind of share it with audiences and say, okay, coachable really means two things. Coachable means you want to be better and you're willing to change. Now, when I say, okay, raise your hand if you want to be better, everybody raises their hand. (laughs) And then the second part of that, all right, now raise your hand if you're excited to change. Well, there's fewer hands that go up. (laughs) And so that idea of change, I think, is where sometimes we get stuck because everybody wants to be better. The issue is we get to a point where because of complacency, we decide we're going to find a way to get better in our own way, doing what we know. And I think that that places a ceiling on our improvement. You know, that reminds me of a story. Um, I'm a big fan of the band Rush. And unfortunately, a couple of years ago, the, the drummer Neil Peart passed away. But there was a, a, I've watched so many of the documentaries behind the scenes. And after a storied career, 20, almost 30 years on the road as one of the best drummers that most people cite, He said, I think I need to do something different and actually sat down and worked with a different drummer to reteach himself how to drum. And he literally, (laughs) here's the greatest drummer in some people's minds in the world saying, I think I could do this differently or better. I just have always done it this way and I'm willing. And it took him a little while, but he really re-envisioned how to drum, which is amazing when you start thinking of that. In terms of being coachable, he thought, I don't want to settle. I want to do better. What can I do differently? And I think that's a, it's hard to do, easy to say, hard to do. Unbelievably difficult. And obviously, you know, something that that a lot of people struggle with because the struggle with change, I think, is in how it's presented, like so many other things. It's in the presentation. You know, if if I'm forcing you, if I'm commanding you, we're going to do this and you got to do so and so. I think that the natural response is to kind of push back a little bit. And, and, and I think that that sense of um, frustration that people feel is I'm not going to let you push me and I'm not going to let you tell me. And so that, again, back to that sense of autonomy of me wanting to be able to make my decision or me be able to see the benefit that maybe you see, but you've not communicated well. And I think that uh, it is unbelievably special for somebody to take the initiative to want to change themselves when they've reached an elite level of performance. That's like, you know, the, somebody gets the batting title and they decide they're going to be a switch hitter now. You know, I mean, that, that, that's an unbelievable thing to say, you know, I've reached such an elite level of success and I still want to be better because what happens in most cases is we get comfortable and we get good enough and then we want to coast a little ways. And sometimes you, know, you, you realize that there's only one direction people can coast and that's downhill, not up. How hard is that, though? Because a lot of people would argue and say, obviously, I've reached the level of success where I am. I must have done something right. How are you, who are you to tell me what I've done is wrong or that I need to do something different? Oh, well, and I think that that's where the issue comes in. And, and, and you in staying coachable, you know, part of the issue, I think, is that idea of, there's a frustration in being told without having a sense of the benefits or the reasons why, you know, why, why do we need to change? What needs to change and why? And I think that it's only through connection and curiosity that you really open the door to where people are willing to thrive in change instead of to resist it. Um, and so obviously the, you know, the story is another parable and it opens up with a father and a son, both frustrated because professionally for the father and athletically for the son, they're being forced to adopt something or to do something different than they're used to. Um, And they meet in the midst of a hike, this wise guide that begins to share with them over the course of a number of letters, you know, that process of staying coachable is basically four steps. And, and she, she introduces each of the steps 
with really important questions. And I think that as a leader, I became far better when I was focused on connecting with my people and asking them questions to get them to make a commitment instead of me wanting to control it from the front end. And, uh, and that, I think, is, is one of the major takeaways of the book is the power of connecting and staying curious with questions and letting those questions become the catalyst for change. You know, in, in general, because we're getting close to the end of the interview here and we're up to your, your recent book, and I'm going to give you a chance to pitch them and talk about where they can find them and where they can get in touch with you. If there's people listening that are looking for someone to come in and maybe consult or talk with their teams or maybe start working on a, a culture shift because they've realized they've hit a wall. Uh, the two things I learned when I was with IBM, and they were the two things that I just loved from our CEO at the time, was the two phrases, work smarter, not harder, and don't confuse being busy with being productive. And I think in general, a lot of what you're talking about is not settling. Well, we've always done it this way. Well, just because we've always done it this way doesn't mean it's right. the right way. Things change. People change. We, we evolve. There may be new ways. And so you shouldn't stay complacent. You should always be looking. Can I change? Am I Because I want to work smarter, not harder. And I want to do things that are productive, not just busy. Yeah. And, and that's that, you know, that same old, and it becomes a powerful phrase because it's so true. Good is absolutely the enemy of better. And if I'm going to settle for good, at some point, good enough won't be. And so if we're striving for better, you know, that idea of a best practice is only a best practice for a while until we find a better practice. Right. Uh, and, and that idea of people being willing to change all comes back to, A, what is the mountain you want to climb? What is that summit you want to reach? You know, why are we here? What is that goal? Where do I want to be? What is it that I want? And I think that that's a really difficult question. As simple as it is, it's difficult for some people to answer, whether it's in terms of a career or in terms of as a team, what is it that we're trying to accomplish? What is it we really want? Because a lot of times we'll look at a, you know, a menu and if you don't choose something, you don't eat. Hmm. <laughs> right. So you got to make that decision of what we're going to focus on because you can't have everything. And I think sometimes we, we live in this fog of I'm not really sure what I want and fog's frustrating. And so that clarity of what do we want is the single most important thing, because after that, then you need to be honest about where you're at and asking yourself, what are those numbers that I have? And instead of excusing or explaining them away, I need to take a hard look in the mirror and, and be honest about this is where I'm at. And once you can do those two things, and again, sounds a whole lot simpler than the process might be when you have those internal conversations. But if you can identify what you want and then you identify where I'm at, it's the gap that becomes obvious that allows us to be humble enough to find a mentor that can help us to close the gap. I think the issue is, you know, sometimes we don't see that person who might be wanting to pour into us as a valuable mentor or as somebody that knows enough to get us to where we want to go. And so our seeking that out is part of that humility, part of, you know, being a cup that is not full and showing up and allowing others who are worthy, who are experienced, who are successful, who have an expertise to pour into us to make us better. Sean, we could probably talk another two, three, four hours. It'd be the longest <laughs> TED talk in the world and still learn new ways of dealing with your company, your culture, your environment, your employees whether you're the employee or you're the boss or somewhere in between. Obviously, your books are a great way to start. So let's very quickly give you a chance. Where can people get your books? Really appreciate you asking. They can find everything that they need at greatresultsteambuilding.com. And on that site, you've got information, not just for the speaking events and team building events and coaching stuff, but uh, obviously under the, the books and products, I've got those books and, and other courses and opportunities where people can develop themselves and their teams. Feel free to reach out. Obviously, greatresultsteambuilding.com is where they'll be able to find all the information they need to get in touch. And I would be thrilled to be a resource for any leader that's interested. Obviously, we got to say hi to your four-legged friend in the background who's been shaking <laughs> and that's awesome. Franklin hey. just came upstairs from his nap. So yeah, he's uh, he's ready for that walk. I am a huge dog fan. I have we my family and I have rescued many 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 dogs. We've got 5 in the house right now. 
So uh, we're just going to let that sit there as as ambiance. We're going to call that. We're, we're going to get. We're going to give that as like texture and flavor for the interview. Um, if somebody does want to get to you directly, and I'm assuming through the website, but you are available to coach or to consult or be brought in, whether it's to bring in some exercises, whether it's to spend a half day, work with senior staff, or work with the employees. How do they get in touch with you? Yeah, Sean at greatresultsteambuilding.com. Uh, find me on LinkedIn, Sean Glaze. Find me on Twitter or Instagram at Lead Your Team. But if you'll just look up Sean Glaze or you look up Great Results Team Building, I'm certainly uh, findable via our friend Google. And as I said, I, I have been so blessed and thankful to be able to work with so many really impressive leaders and organizations who have sought to improve their daily experience and the results that they're getting. Uh, because they did take the time to focus on the thing that when I was younger as a leader myself, I completely neglected. And I think that when you look in the mirror as a leader and you realize that it's not just about strategy, but that your strategy will always be sabotaged if you neglect culture, then uh, you begin to be more intentional about focusing on changing that part of your people's experience. Great. Folks, you've been listening to Sean Glaze here chat for the last hour, and it has been some of the most incredible insights and and some free good advice, but to get the whole package, reach out to him, whether it's email, whether it's social media or go to his website, get his books. I'm telling you, this guy is going to be able to help you guys out there listening right now, figure out what it is that's caused you all to feel blah or why we're not advancing (laughs) or why we're having trouble with morale. Maybe it is something that can be very easily identified, but you never know if you don't ask those questions. And as you said, Sean, continue to have that curiosity asking, what are we doing wrong? What can we do different? What can we do better? Because like you said, we should always be striving for better. Absolutely. Thanks so much for the conversation. Really enjoyed sharing and would love to be a resource for your listeners. Feel free to reach out. All right. Well, thank you, Sean. He had to leave, but Walt, you're back. You are taking a break in the green room, listening to Sean talk about leadership and group dynamics and teamwork, all the stuff that you're horrible at. So um, <laughs> I hope you learned something. Very true. I'm going to have to take some of this to heart. and uh... <laughs> Get one or two of his books or something, maybe. Or yeah, maybe absolutely. Hand, hand them out to the employees at a Christmas party and say, here's how you can learn how to be a better team member, you damn. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. You Fill my, gaps my pocketbook. The <laughs> <laughs> all the things I'm weak at, you take over. So I'll be fishing. <laughs> bye all right well you know we, we already said at the beginning we're going to bypass the movie so that means we get to go straight to our news segment it's a segment we like to call it's no bullshit. and walt as has been the tradition all season long you have the first news item i do and we we kind of come up with one of these every once in a while and i always have to look back and go wait have we talked about this one before but this is another one Homes evacuated after live World War II era munition found <laughs> on Jersey Shore Beach. Holy cow. Ugh. And they find all kinds of stuff on the Jersey Shore. People, uh, garbage, bad reality shows. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No kidding. <laughs> so, uh, but this one's from NJ.com, NewJersey.com. A Wildwood resident found a World War II era munition on the beach and brought it to a nearby residence. Forcing police to evacuate the area Saturday after learning the uh, the aging projectile was still alive, local officials said. Police and firefighters responded to West Pine Avenue around 10, 10 a.m. after receiving a report that someone had found a munition, the local authorities said. Members of the Atlantic City Police Department bomb squad examined the munition. The munition was identified as a 120 millimeter projectile. That's a lot of nuts! From the World War II era and found to be a live round. So 120 millimeter, that's a pretty good size, uh, pretty good size explosive. So, but members of the, the Atlantic City Bomb Squad removed the munition from the residence and transported it to the beach where it was rendered safe. I think they blew it up. Can I ask a question? And and maybe you don't have it in the story. What the hell was it doing on the beach? Um, so let's finish the story real quick. <laughs> and then I'll tell you what I'm I thinking, found. It's not like you were on a military base. It wasn't like there was a skirmish on the Jersey shore. Oh, no. Yeah. No, there was no incursion no, that I'm aware no. of of Germans or. Yeah, no. The, now, there were some that did come ashore from time to time, but it wasn't like an invasion. It was more like a, a spy craft. 
But residents were evacuated for two and a half hours, and the Wildwood Police Department would like to remind residents and visitors that if you located any munition on the beach <laughs> or anywhere else in the city, please do not touch or handle them. <laughs> do not juggle live These ammunition, <laughs> live rounds. Yes, they are dangerous <laughs> and should be handled by qualified personnel only. The police. They don't take said. well to jostling. <laughs> no, they don't. Nor juggling, nor poking. Um, just walk slowly away and don't make any phone calls till you're 100 yards away. In March, two unexploded World War II era ordinances were found in a backyard in Cape May when a homeowner was having a property cleared in landscape, police said. The Atlantic City Bomb Squad removed the ordinances and exploded them on a nearby beach. It's no bullshit. They don't know how they got there. They, they have no idea whether they washed ashore or were left by someone or something else crazy like that. Holy crap. That's actually pretty scary. Yeah, that's really scary. So could you imagine walking along the beach, a public beach, and you're like, you're sitting there and you see like, or, or, or more better than that, you're sitting there in your chair, catching a tan. You got your wife or significant other next to you. You're watching this guy walk on the beach. He's like, do, 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 boom, like a mine going off. It's like, ooh, I wasn't expecting that on my day at the beach. Yeah. And, you know, New Jersey, I mean, you got great white sharks. You've got munitions. You've got syringes. It's a beautiful place. It's a wonderful. It's a, a wonderful day in the neighborhood. <laughs> yeah, it's uh it's quite a neighborhood. So, well, you know, the first time uh, I ever heard anything about something like this was uh, in the town that I, you and I grew up in, Marietta, Georgia. Uh, there's Blackjack Mountain, which yes, with uh, Civil War, uh, there was a, a, a kid War found I. a round in a tree. Yeah, well, no, well, there was that, and also in World War One, they used Blackjack Mountain as an artillery target for training. So there are parts of the mountain that have been developed and they've had to clear munitions from there several times. That's crazy. So yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. It's, it's kind of crazy. Well, while we're on to uh, munitions, which is kind of like war, which is kind of like flying around and maybe dropping bombs and things. How about this? The Pentagon is now set to create another task force to look at unexplained encounters with UFOs. Congratulations on your discovery, which may well prove to be among the most significant in the history of science. I have heard this. Yes. Remember that American ex-military boss who said UFOs are real and we need to prepare for them? Well, it turns out the Pentagon was actually listening. As of the week leading into Thanksgiving, Deputy Secretary of Defense launched an investigative force it has one purpose and one purpose only, to observe, track, and identify UFOs, or what they're now calling unidentified aerial phenomenon, which I guess is a UAP, as the Army likes to now call them. Hmm. The Airborne Object, check out this acronym, it doesn't even work. The Airborne Object Identification and Management Synchronization Group, or AOIMSG, ro rolls right off the tongue, right? Oh, yeah. Isn't the first DOD agency to keep tabs on UFOs, though. It will replace the Navy-operated Unidentified Aerial Phenomena Task Force. Quit wasting my time. The AOI-MSG will synchronize efforts to detect, identify, and attribute objects of interest in special use airspace and assess and mitigate any associated threats to safety of flight and national security, the DOD said in a statement. Now, according to the Defense Department, the new agency is needed to better address the appearance of UFOs near military training facilities. The DoD report from June of 2021 says that the current processes and policies are not properly scaled. Now, why are we doing this? According to this, in all fairness, none of the UFOs caught on camera are necessarily extraterrestrials. What the Defense Department is interested in is what actually are, is flying around our bases. It's more likely the objects could be experimental, advanced aircrafts from other nations. Considering the seemingly impossible feats they're capable of, it makes sense the DoD would want to know more about them. This theory isn't completely baseless either. For example, in July of 2021, China tested a new hypersonic plane. The aircraft can circle the globe at five times the speed of sound while popping off missiles. The U.S. government had no idea China had developed such technology. If the plane had been caught on camera, it most definitely would have triggered some UFO flags. It's no bullshit. They're not admitting to any kind of extraterrestrial kind of engagement. They're more worried 
that there are countries or nations that may have developed enough technology that is undetectable right now or creating the impression of UFOs, but they may actually be hostile or at least probing our own defenses. Hmm. Very interesting. Very interesting. Very interesting. You might, Rabbit. You might. <laughs> well, that's that's weird. Um, well, and you always hate when uh, something like that happens and that you kind of want the government to go, ah, nah, there's nothing like that around. Don't worry about it. And uh, you at least want that assurance that there's nothing to worry about. Now they're like, ah, yeah, there's something to worry about. Let me ask you this. If all of a sudden they came out with a report today based on all the movies, all the books, all of the conjecture, and they said, you know what? We're finally going to admit it. We've been probed for the last 20 years by some or 50 years by some alien force, but they've pretty much left us alone. So we haven't really we haven't really thought too much about it. But, yeah, we do know there's life out there. Would you think people would freak out or would they just go? Oh, yeah, of course. Well, that's a good question. I think people would freak out. Do you really? Yeah, I do. I think the average person, you know, most of us are going to keep a level head and say, you know, OK, whatever. And, uh, but I think, I, no, I think that there'd be, well, for one thing, I do know that nobody would ever trust the government again. Oh, and I don't know why they trust Wait a the minute. government now. But do they trust them now? <laughs> many of us do. don't. <laughs> uh, some do, but many don't. Well, you um, know what's crazy? I've always been a fan of that line. I know Carl Sagan, when he, uh, he wrote Cosmos and he was a great, great writer trying to make the cosmos more acceptable and, and easier to talk about with the lay person. But I love the line that when they're talking about how big space is and when asked, well, do you believe in life out there? And he goes, well, you know what? If there isn't, it would be a dramatic waste of space. Hmm. Yeah, good point. Good point. So. Whether or not we run into them, who knows? But it is something to think about when there's that much out there. What a waste if we're the only life in the entire universe. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it's tough to think about. So. Yeah. Well, cool. Well, I've got the next news, and this comes from Forbes.com. Why your Griswold-style holiday display could snag an $11,000 fine from the FAA. Uh-oh. Wait, we we just got done talking about uh, government trying to find out what's going on with flying around, and now you've got the FAA involved. Yeah, I didn't mean to do that, but uh, here we are. Uh, if this season brings out the Griswold in you, the FAA has a request. While over-the-top home decorations may spread both Christmas cheer and jealousy among your neighbors, please make sure your holiday laser lights are aimed at the house and not at the sky. <laughs> in recent years, holiday light projections have become all the rage in seasonal decorating. That required untangling endless yards of string lights and standing on a ladder in the bitter cold. In a recent statement, the FAA said that holiday laser displays can cause major problems for pilots. Each year, we receive reports from pilots who are distracted or temporarily blinded by residential laser light displays. Inconceivable! You might not realize it, but, but any well-meaning attempt to spread holiday cheer has the potential to create a serious safety risk to pilots and passengers on airplanes that fly overhead, continues the statement. So please make sure all laser lights are directed at your house and not pointing towards the sky. The extremely uh, concentrated beams of laser light reach much further than you might realize. Laser strikes have been reported as high as 10,000 feet, according to FAA data. As of November 22nd, the agency has received 8,500 laser strike reports for 2021, up from 6,800 in all of 2020. Wow. Moreover, laser light strikes have, have struck. <laughs> I'm going to do that one again. Moreover, laser strikes have spiked since the pandemic began. The number of reported incidents in 2020 jumped 12 percent, despite a 60 percent year over year decline in overall flights flown last year. So I guess people got bored, bought lasers and started playing with them. Let's see if you can tag the plane. Uh, don't do that, Bob. Well, here's uh, here's what everybody needs to be aware of. The crime is punishable by up to five years in prison and a $250,000 fine, though most offenders get off far easier. The FAA has leveled penalty, penalties up to $30,800 for serial offenders. It's no bullshit! Wow. Yeah, you don't want to mess with that. You're, we, the minute you're, in, you're impacting government entities, government-run agencies, you're looking at serious problems. 
Well, and I mean, let's be honest, we joke around about stuff with the government, but you start screwing with this stuff and you are endangering people's lives. So True. when it comes to the planes, yes. Yeah, let's let's just have fun, but keep it aimed at the house. Aim it at your house, right? Or if it's on your gun, the intruder who broke into your house. But that's yes, for a absolutely, day. absolutely. <laughs> All right. Speaking of an intruder in your house, were men dead? How about this story? I've got one from India. Man declared dead, found alive in the mortuary freezer seven hours later. Oh my gosh! Yes. Some facts of life should be self-evident. For example, dead people don't come waltzing out of a mortuary outside of religious texts or horror movies. (laughs) Recently, though, one Indian man managed to flaunt the laws of nature. He died only so that hospital staff could pull him out of the mortuary freezer seven hours later. There's a lot to this story. Let's get into it. Shrikesh Kumar, age 40, is an electrician from Moradabad, in northern India. On my birthday, November the 18th, he was involved in a serious traffic accident when a speeding motorcycle plowed him down. Although first responders rushed him to a nearby district hospital, the doctors declared there was nothing they could do. That same night, they pronounced Kumar had died from his injuries, according to the Times of India. As per standard procedures, the hospital staff wrapped up his body, wheeled him into a freezer, where he was only supposed to come out where he was going to get a post-mortem examination. Well, let's fast forward. Seven, seven, Walt, seven hours later, Kumar's relatives arrived at the hospital to identify his remains and authorize his autopsy. Hmm. Among them was his sister-in-law, uh, a woman by the name of, uh, let's see here, Madhubala Gautam. Police wanted four family members to sign the paperwork, and I decided to enter the mortuary. Gautam noticed something strange. Kumar was actually warm to the touch and seemed to be moving. Outstanding. As far as she knew, dead people aren't supposed to do that. The moment Gautam noticed that Kumar was still alive was caught on video that has now since been posted on social media. Gautam exclaimed, he's not dead. How did this happen? Oh, my gosh. Look, he wants to say something. He's breathing. The family members called the police and doctors to come look at the man. Sure enough, he wasn't anywhere close to as dead as the doctors had initially thought. The medical staff immediately pulled Kumar out of the freezer. He was transported to a health center in a nearby city. According to Vice, which is another publication, his condition had improved, but it wasn't clear yet just to what extent he would recover. He's on a ventilator. And they said they're worried about clotting on his brain. Now, as a wrap up, on the day that Kumar supposedly died, the coolers in the hospital's mortuary had actually been malfunctioning. This may actually be what saved his life. According to an anonymous doctor, that's what probably led to his miraculous recovery. Per guidelines, freezers are supposed to be at or below 50 degrees Fahrenheit to prevent the body from decaying until the family can identify the body or the post-mortem autopsy can be done. However, there was an issue with power and the freezer, and they switched off prematurely, which kept him warm enough to survive. In other words, the electrician's life was spared thanks to an electrical fault in the freezers. It's amazing. It's astounding. But it's no bullshit. That is crazy. Makes me freaked out every time I think about a story like this. Could you imagine waking up and you're in one of those little freezers going, what the hell? No. I'm not dead. That would be. I'm still alive. Oh, (laughs) that is a nightmare. Bring bring out your dead. I'm not dead yet. Real nightmare. I feel fine. (laughs) I feel happy. Oh, that is just horrifying. That is absolutely horrifying. Hmm. All right. Well, let's go on to our final segment. A segment is, uh, oh, Jesus, my my transition sucks. <laughs> let's go on to our final segment, our entertainment segment. This is where we give you guys a chance to hear about what we've been watching, what we've been listening to, and maybe what we've been reading. And Walt, we'll go to you first. We'll do the watching. What have you been watching? heading up into thanksgiving week i have um i've been watching a couple things uh one of them is that 
John Claude Van Johnson show that you had recommended. You finally watched some of those? Yeah, so I'm about three or four episodes in, and it is hysterical. I love this show, and um, I just have not had time to really sit down and binge. But um, I'm I'm trying to knock out an episode every couple nights. It is absolutely hilarious. Do you see what I mean? How he's definitely poking fun at himself and the genre of movies. Oh yeah, and one thing I didn't I didn't know about John Claude Van Damme is he has a great sense of humor. And yeah. he really is a great comic actor. So it's really a fun show. It, and is kind of not really campy, but as, as spoofy as it is, it it's is a little campy. Really, I'm okay it's with a little saying campy. that. Yeah, no, yeah. I'm totally cool with campy. Uh, it's really a really fun show. And, um, and like I said, I mean, Sean Claude Van Damme is absolutely hilarious. So um, check that out. Just a great break from all the really intense stuff going on in the world right now. Um, another one that I saw today on uh, on Hulu, actually, uh, A&E Network has a show called Biography, and it's a different kind of biography. They're looking at stuff like um, MTV, for example, and there's their first episode is called I Want My MTV, and it is the history of our favorite network growing up, and that is MTV. And I had forgotten a lot of stuff and uh, a lot of stuff I just didn't know or care about, frankly, before I watched this. Um, but one of the things I brought up is, you know how MTV had um, like that animated MTV symbol that changed every like tenth of a second during their commercials? Uh-huh. Yeah, that was um, they had hired someone, some design person to do a logo. And he came in with like 25 logos and they were like, yes. Yes, those are our logos. And so instead of picking one of them, they picked all of them. And And just just, rotated through them. And rotated through them (laughs) on every commercial. and Which made it feel like now it's an animated logo. It was. Yeah, it was. And what the the person who made the decision said about it was, we wanted to have the feeling that we weren't the same thing every day. We were different. We were unique. We were always going to be changing. And um, and they hoped that that was a statement. So there's a lot of cool stuff about it. They interview several of the VJs and um, go through, you know, that after like five or six years, how the network went from playing videos all the time to uh, to playing, you know, all the reality shows, the first reality TV. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And, And what a huge success that was. And of course, I was, you know, I grew up on the videos. I grew up watching music. Oh, yeah. And they said their ratings were headed downhill and they really had to make a change or they were going to be off the air. And I think it was Alan Hunter or one of the other original people there said, basically the the people who had gotten rich on MTV said, we want to still be rich. So we're going to make some changes. (laughs) And I don't know, from a business perspective, it makes sense. I mean, I hated to lose the, you know, 24 hours of videos, but, um, but that's really cool. It's called, you know, like I said, it's on any network biography. I want my MTV. You can find it this month on Hulu. It's about an hour, hour and a half. And it's, it's really fun. So check that out. And then the last you know thing. What's cool. If you're an, if you have Sirius XM and you listen to the eighties on eight, oh, yeah, so, yeah. Eight, a lot of those original VJs are actually there as the eighties VJs or, uh, or I guess disc jockeys now introducing all these eighties songs on that channel. So Alan Hunter, who is one of the original VJs uh, on MTV, on the classic Rewind channel on XM, which is channel 25, uh, he, he's the morning VJ or DJ. Yeah, classic Rewind is a great channel. Oh, it's, it's, it's one of my favorites. You and me, we grew up in the cassette tape era, and that's what they kind of like. That's why it's classic Rewind. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it is really, really fantastic. It's, it, he does a great job, and he brings, you know, his voice sounds exactly like it did in the 80s. Uh, but he brings a wealth of knowledge and some great stories to it. So um, check that out at Channel 25, uh, Classic Rewind. And some of the best music you'll ever hear is on that network. Oh, and the last thing I was going to mention that I'm watching. Sorry, I'm all over the place tonight. There's a great show called The Tick that um, made the rounds a couple of years ago on Amazon Prime. And it's kind of had a little bit of a resurgence and popped back up several times on my searches. But check out The Tick. It was a a two season run, I believe uh, about three or four years ago. And it is super entertaining, hilarious, uh, kind of a superhero spoofy type show. 
And I would love to see another iteration of the tick come along. So uh, check that out. All right. Well, on your recommendation, where you watched Jean-Claude Van Johnson on my recommendation, I binged the entire season of Catching Killers. Oh, yeah. One after the other after the other. Just four hours or five hours straight. Probably longer than that. Yeah, it's about six, it's six episodes. Six or, seven, six or seven episodes, whatever. I watched them all. Just I could not get enough of that. That was such a cool series. So I'm so glad you brought that up on Netflix. Catching Killers, where they interview the police or and sometimes the media or maybe uh, authors or other people that might have been involved in the catching of or the, the pursuit of serial killers. What a great show. I hope they have more. I, I hope they have another season. It was it was really engaging. It really, really was. It was just an, an awesome show. I mean, Especially really insightful. The perspective of the police work. And the frustrations of when leads didn't pan out or when things came to a dead end or when they thought they had the guy and the guy decided to showboat on TV and use that for his own personal gain and turned out it wasn't the person, but they were buying into uh, just so many twists just, and, and all based on reality. Like for me, that's the true reality show. Watching cops try to catch a bad guy. Yeah, it really is a fascinating world that those that I was going to say those guys generically speaking but those folks work in i mean it's a dangerous world and a disturbing world at times yeah but that whole world of police work is really a fascinating world when you get into the minds of of some of the serial killers now i started reading this series by robert jordan when i was in college when it first started coming out and i kind of got bored by book six and i just stopped but the wheel of time is being made into a show on amazon on amazon prime and they dropped the first three episodes so the wife and i before she left were able to watch wheel of time episodes one two and three it's okay it's not game of thrones yet which was really engaging it took a while to kind of get going it's certainly not lord of the rings yet but it is a fantasy series and if you're into fantasy it's interesting so far, but they've only dropped the first three episodes. They, spunk, they they sunk a lot of money into this Robert Jordan Wheel of Time fantasy series. So we'll see how it goes. But um, I'm going to keep watching it because I think it's got promise, but a little slow so far. I saw the Tom Hanks flick News of the World set in like the post-Civil War era where his job is he goes from town to town in the Old West with newspapers because people don't know how to get news. So he was technically like your evening news. He actually read the news to people so they would know what was happening uh, in the rest of the world. Yeah, Uh Such a cool premise, such a terrible movie. It's two hours. I'm never getting back. Really? That is too bad. Really disappointed in it. It just, it had a couple of nice moments, but for the most part, I was just like bored. And I kept looking at my, at my phone, like what time, how, when does this end? When does this end? When does this end? And it ended, and I was like, I got nothing out of it besides uh, learning that there were people who at some point in history traveled from town to town reading the news. That's all I got out of it. So wow, that go really into it with sucks. some caution. I'm not saying you shouldn't watch it. I'm just saying don't set your expectations for anything too great. Okay, so yeah. is it a just a bad Tom Hanks movie, or is it just a bad movie? I think it's just... I think Tom Hanks probably did it because it had an interesting premise, the idea of a person who can influence what might be going on in cities by reading certain news stories. The the, the whole idea is he comes across a person who's been lynched and there's a girl who speaks uh, Native American, but she's obviously a, a white girl with blonde hair. So at some point she must have been abducted by natives, uh, taught how to speak uh, one of the dialects, then was re-rescued and was in the way to being brought home when something happened. And so he thought my job is to bring her home. And so it's sort of like the, he's like becomes the, the, the father figure to this girl. He doesn't know how to be a dad, but he knows he feels an obligation to protect this girl. It's got all the classic elements of somebody who needs to bring somebody home, mm. but it just fails. It just does not hit at least it, not for me. I just felt bored. That's not good. No. So other two things very quickly as we wrap this up, I'm going to say as far as videos uh, or what I'm watching, 
I can't help it. Every week, the two YouTube videos I, or YouTube channels I go to, Ashley Burton uh, goes by Awkward Ashley with her movie reactions and also Popcorn in Bed. Fantastic. If you just like watching somebody watching a movie for the first time and you get a, that vicarious sense of living through their eyes and maybe it reminds you of what it was like for you to watch that same movie the first time, two really good reaction channels. So check them out. Okay, cool. All right, so let's move on to reading, if anything. Walt, what do you got? Yeah, so I'm still, I've mentioned this at least once or twice before. Um, I'm, like I said, I just don't have a whole lot of reading time right now, but uh, there is a great book I'm plowing through slowly but surely called Killing the Mob. I highly recommend it. It's by Bill O'Reilly. And I was uh, reading it the other day and somebody came up to me and they were like, I have read every single book in that series and they are all fantastic. And I don't even like Bill Riley, Bill O'Reilly. So uh, he has 12 or 13 books in that series, uh, killing Hitler, killing the SS, killing everybody, killing me softly, <laughs> you know. Um, but, uh, you know, people killing who, Abraham Lincoln, killing Jesus, yeah. I mean, he's got all of them have that killing, whatever. I've heard that killing Jesus is the hardest one to find, but if you're looking for an actual book book, then you can get them on Kindle, but yeah, apparently this series is awesome. My brother also is a big fan of it. He's read all the books. Um, so I will, uh, but it is, it's an easy, they're easy reads. And like I said, the one I'm reading is killing the mob. It, it apparently has some good insight into the Kennedy assassination and uh, some of the author's opinions on that. Uh, so anyway, I, I, it's a great book, and uh, I highly recommend it. Cool. That's it? That is it. I'm trying to focus on one book right now. <laughs> yeah, I'm doing the same thing. I had so much going on with the holidays approaching, decorating, all the stuff that's going on, but I'm still trying to make my way through Dune. I find it a very interesting read and just sort of blown away I, whenever I go back and realize this book was written in 1965, just on the cusp of computers, mm. just, I mean, some of the stuff that's in here is obviously influenced by some of the Middle East turmoil of the day. Some of the, you know, where is, where are computers taking us? Where is society taking us? Where, where are we as a species headed as, as human beings? And to be the kind of a brain, the kind of a mind of like Frank Herbert, to think about, well, where will human beings be 10,000 years from now? It's just, I'm kind of blown away thinking that somebody in 1965 conceived of some of these ideas and created such a franchise. So it's, it's a really good read. Okay. I'm putting that on my list. Well, let's go to listening. What are you listening to, Walt? A couple of guys, classic rewind in the morning with Alan Hunter. Yeah. Classic rewind. Um, you know, try to listen to that on the way to work just to uh, kind of keep some of the other craziness out and relax on the way. But uh, a couple that I'll revisit uh, that we've talked about earlier, uh, true spies, a great uh, series on spycraft and the history of spies and all that stuff. Um, it's been very good. Uh also, uh, the Conan O'Brien, um, Conan Needs a Friend, that's pretty good every week. Uh, there have been a few that I haven't really been as excited about, um, the, uh, the person he interviewed. But uh, recently, he's had Howie Mandel, John Lithgow, and then this week, he's got Ellie Kemper, who most people know from The Office. Uh, she played the um, kind of squirrely receptionist who took over when Pam moved to the other part of the office. Um, and so he's really getting some great interviews there. So, uh, they're a lot of fun, pretty insightful. And, um, and then finally, just of course, want to recommend as always our good friends over at the radio labyrinth every week, week in and week out, they put out a great show. So, uh, want to remind everybody of them and, and recommend them. All right. I've got a couple of podcasts as well. I'm going to mention once again, 60 MW. They've got a spotlight reflection on RoboCop. It is a massive three and a half hour episode, but Chris and Adam are so damn funny together. And if you only listen in 20 minute chunks or 30 minute chunks, very easy to pick back up and keep listening back and forth on your commute. Really good reflection on the movie RoboCop. And the Time Bandits Minute finally dropped. 
two guys looking at the movie Time Bandits by Terry Gilliam back from the very early 80s, a movie I actually saw in the movie theater when I was 10, almost 11 years old. And I was a, one of the first, in fact, I think I was the first official guest. They did the first three minutes just between the two of them. It's Curtis Blaze and Duncan Shields. I'm on episodes four, five, and six, which is really at the start of the movie. Oh, yeah. And I, I got to tell you, I, I told them what I thought the movie was really about. And I'm not making this up. Duncan said, I never use this phrase. And when I use it, I use it lightly. I, I mean, I don't use it lightly. But what you just said, talking to me, was you just blew my mind. And Curtis Blaze said, I think I have to look at this movie all over again <laughs> for the very first time. So I messed with both of them in episode five. So check it out. Uh, it's just started to drop. I think it's every Monday, Wednesday, Friday now. But the uh, Time Bandits Minute. Very nice. Very nice. On top of that, with the season, I've been listening to Christmas music. And two things I can suggest if you have an Echo or a, uh, an Amazon device or whatever your smart speaker, you can just say, hey, play Christmas music and you're going to get a pretty cool mix. But I will do this. I'll say play new age Christmas music and you get a lot of kind of very slow, very easy to listen, very in the background kind of music. A lot of it's Enya. A lot of it's that style of new age, but with some Christmas harmonies and tunes. So cool to have on in the background. So check it out. Just tell your smart speaker, play new age Christmas music. Very cool. All right. Well, that's going to wrap it up. That's all I've got. All right. I think that's all I've got as well. So, all right. Well, you and I, we're, 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 we're doing our, our, our exercises. Uh, we're doing everything, getting ready for uh, extra eating. Um, I I'm doing the Nathan's hot dog challenge, learning how to dunk my food in water to like make it go down faster. I think Thanksgiving is going to be a feast of feasts this year. Well, good. Yeah. I'm, um, I'm ready to, uh, just see if I can't cram a whole turkey sideways down my gullet. So <laughs> I'll let you know how that goes next week. Do that, do that thing like in the cartoons with you, like you put the whole bird in and you pull the bones out. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm going for. So <laughs> yep, ah, debone yeah. that bird. <laughs> I've, I've done a pretty good job this year of, uh, of getting uh, my weight down a little bit and exercising a lot. So it's all just building up to replacing all that that I've lost with one meal. All right. Well, you know what? You know, we all we all have we all have objectives. We all have goals. Yes, know? we do. We do. We all punish ourselves in different ways. So before we let everybody go and get ready for their own, or this by the time this comes out, we'll be looking at Thanksgiving in the mirror. But how do people learn a little bit more about our show? Well, the best way to, to learn about us is to go to our website, which is thewilderride.com. You can also follow us on places like Instagram and uh, Twitter at thewilderride.com. And uh, you can also finally go to our Facebook page and, and uh, you can find that at facebook.com slash the wilder ride. And you want to follow us there, then a button's going to pop up and say, join the listeners group. What you want to do there is join the listeners group. <laughs> yes. There, there will be three questions that come up just to make sure that you're an actual living, breathing human being. And uh, the listeners group, I, I mean, I have not been on Facebook that much lately, but I check the listeners group every day because uh, mm -hmm. the discussion's great. Stuff people are posting is fantastic. And it's just a great break from all the craziness and monotony of the world. So uh, give that a try and check it out. And um, yeah, I, I think that you will, um, you will find that you are enjoying your time with them. You'll also find out a little bit about our show. If there are special guests coming up and then whenever we drop an episode, we always post it there. So Again, that's facebook.com slash the wilder ride. Follow us there and then join the listeners group. And as I often say on the backside of that, if you are listening to this episode right now and your podcatcher of choice, take a second and hit that share button. Let everyone know what you've been listening to. It takes no time at all and doesn't cost you anything. If you have a few extra seconds, take a second to rate and review the podcast. Always good for our metrics and try to spread the love around. We love to have some, uh, some marketing out there. You guys are awesome when you share and you like and you uh, let people know what you think about the show. So we really appreciate it. And all I have to say is we just have a couple of episodes left. So come back next week. We should have an honest to goodness cowboy historian joining us next week. If all goes well, we will be joined by a guest who joined us in season two, 
who talked about uh, Blazing Saddles when they were talking about the sacking of Rock Ridge. We're going to bring back Jim Dunham. Rock Ridge. Rock Ridge. Rock Ridge. Rock Ridge. Yes. Splendid. Splendid. Uh, we're going to bring back Jim Dunham, who is a cowboy historian, a poet, a painter, an author, an actor, a gun trick artist, a performer, a historian. This guy is a storyteller. He is amazing. And he has lived such a cool life. And so rather than have him weigh in on a movie, we're going to actually talk to him about who he is. His whole life could actually become its own movie. But to learn about him and to check out the episode, you got to come back next week for a brand new episode of the Wilder Ride Listener's Lounge. Oh, Dude, that's great. Yeah, I got to tell you, I am looking forward to mashed potatoes, stuffing, dressing, turkey, cranberry sauce, green bean casserole, corn casserole, you name it. If it's on the table, I'm going to put a scoop on my plate. Yeah, I'm looking forward to getting stuff too. So it's a. Uh... It's going to be awesome. Uh, not if I can get my significant other to say the same thing, but, you know. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. <laughs> yeah, she's never going to listen to this episode. No, this will be the one she No, this will be the and one. Then, yep, this will be the one she listens to. Guaranteed. There will be no season five because of it. Exactly. You will be dead. Exactly. You will be dead. <laughs> Dude, happy Thanksgiving. Happy yeah, Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving.